I'm not sure who's gonna end up watching this, so I'll just start from the beginning. I'm Brent Campbell, Tulsa interior designer, Doug Campbell's son. Dad passed away last November after a nearly five year battle with ALS, which is commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. While his life was cut tragically short, he accomplished a great deal with his time. 2018 Lifetime Achievement Award recipient leaving quite a legacy for my brother and me and our families to sort through. Among his many achievements, I'm glad to say for his sake, is building his dream home exactly as he wanted it. This movie is an attempt to tell the story of his townhouse, why it mattered so much to us, and figuring out what to do with all the treasures that dad left behind. As I see it, there's no way to do this right and briefly. So I'll tell you what's here, include specific timestamps below so you can skip around if you want. After the intro here, I'm sharing old images a photographer took of the house I grew up in on 26th Street back in the 1990s for a magazine spread. Followed by images realtor Peter Walters photographer took of the townhouse before he put it on the market in mid June. Meanwhile, Dad's partner Wes had to close on his new place and take what he was going to take. And then my brother and I had to come collect our birthright in a way. Objects that we had come to identify with our whole lives. Dad trained us well. <laughs> From there, with images and video, I take you with me on my journey to Tulsa and back. Followed by the mad dash while I was in Tulsa from July 29th through August 5th, where I was taking it in one last time, taking it down, our brother David flying in, loading the trucks, reviewing, purging, and organizing dad's files, resolving loose ends, and getting one final day. Then I got to unpack dad's treasures back here in our home. Now, with that intro out of the way, for those of you who did not know him, my dad, Doug Campbell, was a well-admired and enormously talented interior designer where I grew up in oil boom town, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Dad had his hands in many things in the Tulsa community throughout his adult life. I was on the staff at Philbrook for nearly four decades. I genuinely cannot remember a time during all that uh, that Doug wasn't involved with the museum. And I, the thing is, though, I know from talking to him that his involvement and love for Philbrook goes way before that. Your prints are all over my house also, and I just think you're the most talented person, and um, Tulsa has been blessed to have you. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, your footprints are everywhere. I mean, you go to the airport, you're, you're marching down his work, and. Gilcrease, Philbrook, you know, and then all these homes and the lives you've touched, and you're pretty special, you know. And just to, you know, this is just really for me. Um, all of you are a lot more civilized than I am, but ALS, F you. <laughs> He died last November 2019 at age 72 after nearly five years of facing ALS with grace, knowing full well what he was up against as he'd helped his partner John through the very same terrible disease just a few years before. I published a movie about my family's life in 2019, you know, the before times, and I included a tribute to dad in that video which I'll link to in the description below if you'd like to see it and have it yet. After John passed, as Dad put it, John's angel pointed Wes Smith out at a party that both Wes and Dad were attending. They got to talking and that was that. Wes was truly there for Dad up until the very end. He really made the last few years of Dad's life better, not to mention the many lives that Wes touched along the way. Wes is amazing. Truly, Dad knew how to pick him, 
you know, after all, he married my mother too. Anyway, for decades, I struggled to wrap my head around dad's value to the Tulsa community. You know, at home, he was my strong-willed, particular and frugal father, after all. I, mean, you know, I learned early on to take it with a grain of salt when he'd name drop or boast about this or that. Um, sure, you know, there he is in Paris at Thanksgiving having dinner with Andy McDowell and her daughter, Rainy Qualley. Anyone who knew him around that time heard that story more than once. And I'll give him that. It's a cool story. But framing his invitation and her response? Come on. Anyway, nothing but love for Dad. Anyone who knew him well heard these stories as well. But we forgave him for it. After all, they were pretty cool stories. Clients who could afford and value Dad's services tend to live interesting lives and as their interior designer, they'd often become close friends while creating their home. Now that he's gone and I've reviewed most of his files and his life's work, he had his fingers in the fabric of so many cultural aspects of life in Tulsa. And Tulsa has had a few boom times. Uh, certainly the most interesting period architecturally was the roaring 1920s, just before the 1929 crash that led us into the Great Depression. In the 1920s, newly rich oil company executives wanted to have their very own luxurious home in the suburbs, which today is just a few miles southeast of downtown. Hundreds of homes over several square miles in Midtown Tulsa were built with no expense spared. And I gather that most agreed in the 1980s, 1990s, and so on, if you wanted to bring your home in this part of town back to its 1920s grandeur, with discreet modern touches, Doug Campbell was the interior designer you'd call to make it happen. Word spread. And so, from 1977 forward, when Dad and Carolyn Fielder started Campbell Design, their phone never stopped ringing, with well-heeled clients eager to make their homes beautiful, too. Even when I had no reason to know, I could always tell when I walked into one of his rooms. They all had a, a certain warmth about them. If you want to hear your dad um, in his own words, I, I can't recommend more his interview with his decades-long friend, John Erling, on Voices of Oklahoma. I'll link to the interview on VoicesofOklahoma.com and the podcast interview in the description below. Every time I listen to it, I learn something new about dad. He's a delightful interview, and his insights, particularly in the last half, are well worth your time. I've come to understand that I just can't make sense of my own life, or my kids for that matter, without factoring Dad in to what he meant to me, my family, his many friends, or the communities he supported. And the man was not easy to live with, and yet, my life wouldn't be my own without him in it, influencing it, guiding it by example, and the many lessons he pounded into my brain about design, business, culture, and the people driving all three. Currently, I'm still recovering from a journey I took late July going into August that I've known much of my life I need to make. Though it ended up happening a lot earlier than I imagined when my parents told me about my unusual future inheritance. Many of the artifacts have been with our family since my brother and I were little boys. And we both have a great deal of affection for many of Dad's items. So it was sort of a rite of passage meeting my brother in Tulsa as we went home in the middle of the pandemic to collect and divide Dad's lifetime collection of art, artifacts, and furniture. While I've been swamped much of the first half of 2020 in part dealing with settling dad's financial affairs much sooner than expected, thanks to Peter Walter, we sold the townhouse in mid-June, which meant that all of dad's art, artifacts, furniture, and other physical assets in the townhouse had to be taken down and distributed among dad's partner Wes, my brother and his family, and me and my family all within six weeks. First, the I's needed to be dotted and the T's crossed, so among those tasks was properly appraising the items in the townhouse, closing on it 1st of August, and getting everything cleared out. 
I created a spreadsheet with a complete inventory with all of Dad's art, artifacts and furniture, nearly 100 items. The townhouse is by our client of Dad's luck was interested in keeping some of the things in the house and in some cases we agreed that they should stay with the house while with others my brother David and I felt should stay with the family. Meanwhile Wes wanted some things and dad's longtime colleague wanted a few others. Next I had to get home to Tulsa to oversee getting everything sorted packed up and distributed. Since I shouldn't fly due to COVID-19 I decided it'd be best to drive to Tulsa in the M3, which I knew would be a fun journey, you know, a couple days just to think and enjoy the ride. I hit the road around 7 a.m. in the M3, uh, Monday, July 27th for my 22 hour drive to Tulsa. About six hours later, I arrived at the Trogues Brewery in Hershey, Pennsylvania, a time for a launch I look forward to every year. I picked up some beers while I was at it. Then, about four hours after that, I stopped in Triadelphia, West Virginia at the local Permanente Brothers for one of their legendary sandwiches and some tots. Late that night, I arrived in Bloomington, Indiana, and the next morning, I toured on foot what I could of my alma mater, Indiana University. That morning, I drove through Southern Indiana uh, on route to St. Louis on a perfect day. I had a very late lunch in St. Louis, Rolled up to the townhouse here in downtown Tulsa at 11.30 Tuesday night and bed's gone already. I slept on a sofa. I took Wednesday one last time to soak the townhouse in before dismantling everything. I spent much of the day living in the space, uh, looking at the details Dad had planned so carefully, again, closely photographing it, wanting to make sure I felt like I'd had the chance to fully appreciate his creation. Though I'd been building on it for weeks, the spreadsheet and slideshow I created came in handy for accounting and inventory, uh, appraising objects, determining who got what, making sure that they did, making sure that it's all properly accounted for to you know, please Uncle Sam. David flew into Tulsa on Friday, and we had less than a day to you know, see Aunt Bev and Wes and get any planning and packing done, not to mention working the details out with Carolyn and the townhouse's buyer on what they were taking before we loaded up the trucks the next day. On Saturday morning, August 1st, David and I picked up our rented Penske trucks and then loaded them up with the crew that we hired. With that, decisions had to be made and the big stuff, about 90% by this point, was packed up. And yes, I'd be sleeping on an inflatable mattress now. <laughs> Meanwhile, we discovered that a front tire on my truck was shredded since the wheels were badly out of alignment. So I had to get that fixed before I could hit the road. That night, David and I went through Dad's clothes. Amazingly, much of it, including many of Dad's shoes, fit me. I ended up inheriting nearly a dozen hats, including a cowboy hat, as many pairs of shoes, along with some pretty cool cowboy boots, dress shirts, slacks, a few suits, including Dad's Armani, Dad's tux, uh, the one that he wore to all those functions at Philbrook back in the day. And while I'm not sure when I'll need a tuxedo or cowboy boots, when the time comes, I've got that problem handled thanks to Dad. David left Sunday in his truck. First thing, the things he wanted to keep and take with him to his family's new home in Georgia. With plenty of sorting, organizing, giving away, and packing to do yet still, I dove in. The next few days were a blur, uh, figuring out how to tackle issues, 
I'd never before had any need to tackle. And I couldn't have done it without my true lifesaver and friend going back nearly 30 years, Wes Freeland. Not to be confused with Wes Smith or Wes Allen. Not only did he help by taking many entirely packing related tasks off of my hands so I could focus on other things I had to get done. He helped with things that would have been very hard for me to do on my own. He spent days of his precious time helping my brother and me for no reason other than he wanted to help. That man is a hero. With little space in the truck and closing on Wednesday, I had just a couple more days to go through dad's files, to purge what I should and pack what I should keep. I uncovered all sorts of mementos, including details about dad's business, correspondence with friends, drawings from many of his projects going back to the 1980s, and financial documents, including every single tax return going back to 1976, which is the year before I was born. I reviewed the Modern Five Townhouse Development Plans, which is a bold collaboration with his longtime friend, Charlie Colmia, uh, and a group of architects and planners that they brought in to get the countless details and decisions right. After all, Dad's townhouse was part of a development of five townhouses, hence the Modern Five. Dad saved everything. I saved what I could that was, you know, of value. After all, he kept direct mailers in the envelopes that they came into. I've gone through most of it, and there were some pretty amazing nuggets. I just wish he directed me to those files in his last years and said, Son, read through all that stuff. When you're done, come and ask me questions. It drives me nuts. I, I now know what questions to ask him, but I can't ask him now. On Monday, after signing the papers to close on the townhouse at the title company, Wes Freeland helped me load up the M3 on the car carrier I was towing behind the truck. I continued sorting, organizing, purging, and packing. It occurs to me that this is the last time I'm going to be able to video camera my dad's house. One of my regrets about the house I grew up in is that it was so beautiful and I'll never be able to go there again. It was my home for 22 years. And this has been my home in Tulsa for, you know, uh, going on 12 years. So it's very sad to leave it, especially considering how much of dad is in it. He spent years designing every inch of the place. As I've been reviewing his papers over the past few days, I've become aware of how much planning went into this house. Every, everything mattered, every little detail. The end result is a magnificent home. I wanted to at least give a tour of the house. Even It's, you know, 95% packed. There's still boxes. It's messy, even though I got here last week and it was spotless, thanks to Wes's hard work. Uh, the remaining things that needed to be packed, uh, you know, brought out <laughs> all the dust bunnies and everything, so. All the furniture and art is gone, except for the few things that the new buyers of the house purchased. Uh, and it was very difficult to let them go, but we felt like it was the right thing that you know, some of these items just belong to the house. Some items belong more with us because they've been with us since my brother and I were little boys and you know, just couldn't stand to, to be without them. Anyway, let's uh, do a quick tour. Beautiful bedroom. The Biedermeyer chest, the Chinese dogs, all packed up. And here we have the shofa, which does not come through very well. That's unfortunate. I, I'll need to capture this during the day. There's the master bathroom. Shower, bathtub. It's a massive closet. This 
so that you can get to the hard reach places. Very clever use of space given that the ceilings are 10 feet high. I think they're 12 feet high downstairs. Actually, I'm not sure. I don't want to misrepresent, but you know, every detail, I mean, you look at the, the working here. I mean, this is all custom, all designed to dad's specifications. TV used to be there, the sectional. This is the place where my girls hung out the most. You see the speakers are in integrated into the wall. Beautiful kitchen. There's tons of stuff out right now because that's what's left to pack up here. So this is the best part. I love the staircase in this house. And again, just look at the details everywhere. Look at this. Here we are on the roof. Best view of downtown Tulsa. You can see the skyline just barely. It looks a lot better from what I'm seeing compared to what comes off on video. But what a great place this must be for parties, huh? Full moon out tonight. Fire alarm building across the street. Art Deco masterpiece. It's pretty cool to get to look out on that. Thing I want to do now is turn off this light so that we can see how the light comes through and reflect through the stairs. And I can see the prisms here, but you can start to see how the light comes through here. And if you look really closely, I don't, I think it's too dark for us to be able to see this, but it looks like prisms of light. This one painting is still up here and it is glorious. This is a Jeannie Gooden painting. She's a dear family friend. She was a valued client of dad's. And it's a special piece and it belongs there. And I'm so glad that the new buyers decided that it should stay too. Thankfully, I got a badly needed extra day with many thanks to Kevin, the home's new owner. So, as luck would have it, I ended up having one more night with the townhouse to take in another sunset. I didn't end up sleeping that night more than a week. It was hopeless, but I didn't care. I, I guess I was running on adrenaline. Sleepless, I, I finally had a chance to review the drawings that I'd set aside on a townhouse, dealing everything from the architectural and engineering plans to the custom hardware ordered and furniture dad had designed and had built just so. It's Wednesday, August 5th, 2020. And I just want to make sure to capture this moment. This is the last time at least until if I'm invited back again by the new owners that I'll ever get to be inside 1015 East 8th Street. So I wanted to do one last walkthrough after I finished getting everything cleaned up yesterday or cleaned out more like. The rental truck and the M3 are totally packed to the gills. Bye-bye, Dick. All right. I gotta go say goodbye to Dad's room. And the shofar. I've had this in my family for probably 
about 40 years. That's where Dad slept. That's where he died. I wasn't here. I had been here a few weeks before. Awesome hiding place for the kids. <laughs> So a great storage space. And the bathroom, again, do a quick walkthrough of the guest bedroom. Look at this beautiful marble one last time. where the Philbrook print hung of dad's thank you letter from Philbrook. Look at this stunning marble one last time. Okay, turn out the light. Elevator shaft. Brought dad up and down for years and years. Some very clever thinking to have that installed. Little did he know that he would need to use it. Okay. I locked this door before. I did. Again, beautiful hardware. All the stuff's moved out. That's the buyers stuff up in there. Okay, so I'm gonna make a run for it. Since I don't any longer have a key. That's it. The end of an era. Funny thing is, is I'm taking a full truck and our house is already pretty crammed with stuff. First thing, Wednesday morning, August 5th. Loaded up with my favorite possession, the M3, and about a third of dad's, no pressure. I began the slow 1400 mile journey to Scarsdale, totaling what I figured totaled about 14,000 pounds of cargo. It took two full days with stops for gas, food, sleep, and not much else. With the M3 in tow, parking was a pain. So I had to be very deliberate about making plenty of room wherever I'd stop to get gas, eat, and sleep. I arrived Friday morning, just after 4 a.m. with everything in tow, with no major incidents, though there were a few close calls. For instance, the taillights apparently failed to work on a truck. The parking situation was rough at the hotel I slept in, but that worked out as did when I unwittingly turned down a street just blocks from our house in Scarsdale with only the hard way to reverse down that street a couple hundred yards without jackknifing. The teenage movers we'd hired showed up at noon and within a couple hours, our little house was crammed with fine art, artifacts, and furniture. It was crazy, but bit by bit, our house has come together nicely. Though, I got plenty more to do. As I can, I continue to review Dad's files, sorting through drawings, correspondence, 
keepsakes, and what must be <laughs> a thousand travel guides. So now, just like each of my daughters will get an M-car when I'm gone, they too will someday get to have some of the many beautiful artifacts that their grandfather collected in their homes. But for those of you who are still with me, thank you for watching. I needed to do this. Like I said earlier, the Voices of Oklahoma interview that Dad did with his good friend John Erling is excellent. Here, Dad talks about so much more than design. Among other topics, he talks at length about coming to terms with his sexuality and ALS. And it's fascinating to hear his perspective. Due to COVID, our plans to have a celebration of life for Dad at Philbrook on May 17th this year did not happen. I don't know if it ever will. So much is up in the air these days. Yet, the 2019 movie I made, starting at 25 and a half minutes, captures what it was like and some of the many wonderful tributes we received when Dad passed in November. I'll link to that below too. Since we knew Dad had limited time, a friend and client of Dad's, Debbie Zinke, very generously threw a celebration of life party for Dad at Philbrook in January 2016, while he was still able to take it all in. It was an extraordinary evening, full of tears and laughter, an evening that no one of the 350 of Dad's closest friends in that room that night will ever forget. Uh, I'll link to that YouTube channel below where I publish videos from that party too. And finally, true to dad's wishes, when the time is right, we'll fly to France, travel down to Provence, climb a particular hill in Roussillon, and we'll scatter dad's ashes.